Our second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 5. That's page 100 or 1222 in the church Bibles. So 1 Peter chapter 5, and we'll start from verse 1, page 1222, if you have the church Bibles. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. London. All leadership is costly, the price of leadership. Authentic Christian leadership, especially so. And Peter's aim in this part of his first letter is that Christian leaders should lead Christianly. The context, of course, of this, as we saw last week, is the marginalized and the maligned Christian faith. You are exiles, writes Peter. They will speak against you, says Peter. They will malign you. They will insult you. You have been plucked out of the futile ways of life handed down to you by your forefathers. They will hate you. So the context into which Peter writes his letter is an almost exact photo fit of our culture today. We had an evening for city workers, city partners in the ministry here at St. Helens on Monday evening, and somebody who knew something of Russian history came up to me and said, we will be in the gulag by 2030. Another city partner, I've been asked to change the language I've used, I've been asked to pin footers to my emails advertising single-issue pressure groups. I'm asked to show, to do this, to show that I am an ally with a somewhat sinister implication that if I don't do it, I must be an enemy. The same man, by no means hysterical, continued, William, if you go on speaking and calling out the farmyard morality of our prime minister and government ministers, and if you continue to speak openly against the anti-Christian pronouncements of certain diocesan bishops, you'll end up in the cell next to me. I think he was rather nervous at that prospect. <laughs> well, there's been much in the Christian press and in the minds of Christians around the theme of failed Christian leadership that has and always is so shameful. But the context of today's part of Peter's letter is not so much failed leadership as the maligned church. Why would anyone ever in a million years step up to lead given the way the world treats Christians? First, the privileged responsibility of Christian leadership is to oversee the flock of God. Now, you can see from verse 1 that Peter addresses, addresses elders. There's no definite article. Also from verse 1, Peter sees himself as a fellow elder, and they are to exercise oversight, verse 2, and they are to exercise oversight of the flock of God that is among you this might cause some of us to breathe something of a sigh of relief. Peter has narrowed the field. I am only in my 30s. I'm not an older, nor am I ordained. I'm clearly not included. Not so fast. 
I'm going to spend a bit of time on this because so many of us are thinking about this at St. Helens at this stage of our life together. Clearly, the elders being addressed are older men. That much is plain from verse 4, where, sorry, verse 5, where Peter says, Likewise, you youngers be subject to elders. Again, no definite article. So Peter may be speaking about older men with specifically designated responsibilities, and in the New Testament church, it does appear that patterns were taken from Old Testament of appointing older men to positions of responsibility, and such positions were recognized within weeks of new groups of Christians being formed in New Testament times. Paul and Barnabas were appointed elders in chapter 14, just a matter of days after Paul's mission to the areas where they were appointed, el- el- where Paul and Barnabas appointed elders, just a matter of days after they'd done missions. And later on, those elders were designated as having also been appointed by the Holy Spirit. So Peter may be speaking about older men with specifically designated responsibilities. Incidentally, there's no evidence at all that I can see, you may be able to tell me I'm wrong, in the New Testament of elders being elected. So our 20th century, 21st century obsession with democracy is not necessarily a biblical phenomenon. Peter may then be speaking about these formally recognized individuals, but not necessarily only these. Simply by being older, men in the first century had great responsibility. I came across this commentary. I hadn't come across it before. And I think uh, Karen Jobes has a very helpful point for us when she writes this. At the earliest stage of the church in any given locale, Elders probably were not office holders in the formal sense of later church understanding, but men who, by virtue of their age and the prestige of their families, exercised an authority that is informal, representative, and collective based on their seniority and relationships that already existed. I think that's very perceptive and almost certainly right. This suggests responsibility wherever the flock of God is to be found. You'll notice the task of these already recognized older men in verse 1 is to exercise oversight of the flock of God that is among you. And that suggests responsibility wherever the flock of God is to be found, exercised by Christians with responsibility wherever they find themselves. So might I suggest that alongside the formally recognized elders, formerly appointed elders, that uh, with the Industrial Revolution and pandemic notwithstanding, the separation of work from home, this means we're not necessarily speaking only of formal local church gatherings, but Christian groups in offices and at schools and in hospitals and in prisons, on military bases, in local council buildings, on factory floors. Wherever the church of God is among us, Those with responsibilities, as Christians, step up and lead. It's not going to be comfortable. Furthermore, oversight and the task of shepherdly care in the New Testament, as Gwilym just pointed out, is always and only through the teaching of Jesus' word. Jesus is the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and I know them, says Jesus. When Jesus commissions Peter, it is the teaching of his word, feed my sheep, says Jesus. He doesn't have in mind that Peter should go on a master chef course and feed them premium beef burgers. Pastoral care, pastoral care then happens from the pulpit. Pastoral care happens from the lectern. Pastoral care happens in your small group at work where you are exercising some sort of Bible teaching. That's how pastoral care happens. You sometimes hear someone say of a person, he's a great pastor, but he can't teach the Bible. That is precisely wrong. If he cannot and does not teach the Bible, he may be a great social worker. He's a useless pastor. Where the Bible is central in a Christian group, great pastoral work goes on. Where the Bible is absent, crises are multiplied exponentially and numerous social workers 
and psychological props are required. But then many who are not designated officially as elder or who are not indeed older themselves exercise oversight and responsibility through teaching the Bible. Women are to train the younger women in the church. Fathers have oversight over their families. And young men, such as Titus and Timothy, Mark, these young men are sent as delegates of the Apostle Paul, but are never described as elders or older men, because they are not. They're youngers. My preference is to describe them as apostolic delegates. I arrived at St. Helens, aged 37. I said earlier in this week, I was speaking on this passage, that I arrived at St. Helens, aged 27, and somebody kindly pointed out it must just seem that long. But age, arriving age 37, I always saw myself as an apostolic delegate, just like Timothy or Titus. I had the apostolic word. There were congregations at St. Helens. My job was to establish the older ones and those with recognized responsibilities as Christian overseers and elders. Would that many young men arriving in churches saw themselves in that role. Perhaps better then to see the role of elder and overseer both functionally and positionally, both informally and formally. Wherever the flock of God is found, exercise oversight. The beauty and the divine genius of the New Testament is that it is gloriously unspecific about the precise implementation of these things, giving the principles and not a huge amount more. This means that the raw word of God, the gospel word, can land in any culture, at any point of history, in any demographic and sociological grouping. And churches can be formed, and ministry can be done. Perhaps a lesson worth learning is that we must be very, very careful not to institutionalize and impose historic forms of church governance on 21st century social church situations. We need to do the much harder work of implementing the essential principles in our generation rather than just landing a rigid institutionalized system that developed centuries after the Bible was written that totally fails to fit and actually restricts the advance of the word of God. So I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion. Notice how costly this is going to be. Peter uses the word witness. That is a word that implies cost. In the New Testament, the word witness comes from the word martus. It is the word from which we get our word martyr. To be a witness is far, far more than simply to have seen something. To be a witness is to be a spokesperson as the person who saw. It is equally translated to testify, to give testimony. That explains why the witness is the one who suffers because the witness will not keep quiet. I used to think that there was a development of this word martyrs through the New Testament time to take on the meaning ultimately and eventually of costly testimony. That is wrong. In John 15, when Jesus tells his disciples that the Holy Spirit will bear witness and that they too are to bear witness, the word martyr is used, that command is both preceded and succeeded by teaching on the world's hatred of the witness who cannot but speak. They will hate you because of me. You must bear witness. 
They will put you out of the synagogue and even murder you thinking they're doing service to God. So from its very beginning in New Testament times, the word to witness, to testify, involves verbal speaking and inevitable suffering. This, of course, then, is so absolutely central to the fabric of one Peter. As Peter writes that he is a witness of the suffering of Christ, he speaks not only of having seen, but also of having suffered. He's described Christians as being sharers in the suffering of Jesus, and now he describes himself as a witness who shares in the suffering of Jesus as a sharer in the glory that is to come. It's absolutely central to this letter. This costliness explains why Peter exhorts the elders. So I exhort older ones among you as a fellow older one and witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory. As one with responsibilities formally recognized in the church or not, older ones are being asked to lead. As people with responsibility and with the word of God, you are being asked to exercise that responsibility Christianly among the church of God, wherever you find it. As a teacher, shepherd the flock of God in your halls of residence, in the hospital, as a father, in the church gathering such as we have today, as rector, shepherd the flock of God. Notice how privileged the position is. Exercise oversight in the flock of God. It is God's flock. That little group of Christians, they belong to God, his possession, not actually yours. It's a great commission. Shepherd the flock of God. Notice how flat the whole thing is. Do you know there appears to be very, very little by way of hierarchical structure. Peter has begun his letter, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and now he writes, I exhort the fellow elders among you. And he speaks of the flock of God that is among you, not the flock of God that is under you or the flock of God over which you have been placed. I'm rereading Alan Clark's book entitled The Donkeys, about the First World War uh, soldiers and generals. And Peter is not in his chateau, whilst the believers in Asia Minor are in the trenches. Peter is not six foot above the costliness as a witness. So on Monday, I was studying this passage with a group of bankers from Rothschilds and Goldman Sachs. And I looked out on the faces on the screen and I asked this question, who then are the elders of this flock of God? And everybody looked at me. And I was looking at many of them. And precisely the same thing is happening right now. The right attitude of the Christian leader, point two, is willing Christ-like service. In the right spirit, verse two, not under compulsion but willingly. With the right motive, verse two, not for shameful gain but eagerly. Having the right ma manner, verse three, not domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock. The right spirit, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. That is, not because you must, but out of free choice, voluntarily, spontaneously. Peter says in verse 2, as God would have you. Well, we have the privilege of the gospel. We've been born again into a living hope. We've been given by God an eternal inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and kept in heaven. We're living stones in the temple of God. We have freedom to offer spiritual sacrifice. We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Why might someone not exercise oversight in the flock of God that is among them? Well, I can tell you why. The cost. 
the hassle, the focus on things that are not me and my pleasure, the exposure to public humiliation, the maligned church. A group of senior bankers, I asked them why they wouldn't exercise leadership of the Christian groups in their bank. Oh, reputation. Another church leader, a dear friend of mine, my sort of age, his 20-something son, thinking about Christian leadership. I said, how do you feel about your son thinking about leadership in the Christian church? Oh, he said, great joy and real sadness. Why the sadness? The cost. Why might a person not engage in Christian leadership? A natural shrinking from the responsibilities involved, the desire to avoid the danger to which those who lead in Christian oversight and witness are exposed, a concern for me and my comfort, my freedom to pursue my own pleasures, a hassle-free life. You want a quiet life. You want no additional threat to your career advancement. You want to avoid being maligned and spoken against well, don't step up to Christian leadership wherever you find yourself. I am so, so thankful for many, many people across the many congregations of St. Helens who step up to Christian leadership. It is wonderful that in the congregations of St. Helens and in the workplaces that you all go out to and the communities and the parent governing boards and all the rest of it, those of you who have responsibilities step up to the responsibilities of Christian leadership. It's a wonderful thing. I know it's costly. I know you will be exposed to public criticism. Isn't it wonderful that God says, Peter says, as God would have you? He loves it. He's pleased with it. And I also know that around about this moment, a letter is going to land on many of your inboxes saying, would you consider serving the Lord Jesus by leading a small group again starting in September 2021? Now, I hadn't anticipated that this Sunday would precisely coincide with that letter arriving in your inbox, but shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, in the right spirit, with the right motive, not for material gain, is key there in verse 2. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. The King James Version has not for filthy lucre. But base gain or greed is not necessarily only for financial reward. I happened to speak to a, an old friend of mine who happens to be an archbishop a couple of weeks ago, uh, seven or eight weeks ago, and he said this on the telephone. When I started as archbishop, I thought there were three things that might disqualify a person from public ministry. Money, sex, and power. Of the various Christian leaders who have crossed our screens, disgraced for one form of misconduct or another, there can be few whose failures are not included in the categories of money, sex, and power. But this senior Christian leader said, by the time I'd served 10 years as archbishop, I realized there was a fourth. Thwarted ambition. Perhaps more than anything else, over the last four months, we have witnessed in things people have written and spoken, thwarted ambition. We talked through this passage with the team leaders here at St. Helens on Monday this week, and I encourage the senior team here to beware self-indulgence in leadership. If you want to know what self-indulgence looks like, watch Mick Jagger on stage. Listen to the music of Jim Morrison and the Doors. So much ministry is conducted in public. How easy to allow those one is supposed to be serving to become the servants of one's own self-indulgent desires. I want to be the center of attention. I want everyone to notice me. I must tweet my opinion. 
or ministry should be fun, but it must be my joy, my fun, my jokes, my rudeness to others that everybody laughs at. Early in my time at St. Helens, The Office, the sitcom, Ricky Gervais, was popular. I only ever watched, I think, two episodes of The Office, but I remember seeing David Brent. There was an article on this just yesterday in the Saturday papers, and Brent was, uh, Gervais was saying, it was so popular because it is so close to real life. I remember watching Ricky, uh, David Brent at Ricky Gervais in the office and thinking, never allow that to happen. In the right spirit, with the right motive, having the right manner. Verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. You may remember that Jesus spoke of the leadership styles of the world. The rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, he said, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Jesus was responding to his disciples who were seeking positions of power here on earth in a material kingdom today, and Jesus rebuked them. Such an attitude is incompatible with Christian leadership. It is striking that these examples of power play by Jesus' disciples happen so late in the Gospels, in Luke, even in the context of the Lord's Supper. Even as Jesus washed his disciples' feet, his disciples were jostling for position. It makes us realize that the temptation to domineer the flock and exercise authority over them is never far from the door of any Christian leader. The point about Christian leadership is that it is Christian. We are leading his flock, however small the number may be. How did he lead? Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Knowing the Father had given all things into his hands, that he was come from God and going back to God, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garment. Taking a towel, he tied it round his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet... You are to wash the feet of others. Not driving, but serving. Not bullying, but loving. Not domineering, but being an example to the flock. I love it that the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst has as its motto, serve to lead. Would that that were the case. You serve through those long, unseen hours of preparing to teach the Word of God accurately. You serve in unseen prayer. You serve by adapting your life to those you serve. You serve by saying no to your desires. You serve. I've just read the script of Joel Kenny's book, I would like to encourage everybody to read it when it gets published. It is magnificent, and it only takes half an hour to read. I expect it took a great deal longer than that to write. Joel's sitting at the back there. Servant leadership. Those of us who are involved in leadership need to ask ourselves and to ask others, how do I actually come across How am I leading? Well, says somebody, who in a million years is going to stick their head above the parapet? I can think of a little group of five or six Christians. I seem to be somebody with responsibility in the office. I'm a Christian. I've got some Christian maturity. But who on earth in a million years is going to step up to lead my reputation? We've just sent out two leaders heading to other churches that are quite substantial in size, not the leaders, that is, the churches, 
And I have said to both of them, and I now repent of saying this, I wouldn't in a million years take on the leadership of a church like uh, of such size uh, at this stage of uh, uh, the, the, the country and other countries' history. I repent of that. The ultimate reward of Christian leadership. Look at it. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So this whole piece on Christian leadership is bracketed by Peter, who anticipates a sharing glory, and the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, who by his grace gives the reward, the unfading crown of glory. Don't you love that description of Jesus, the arch shepherd? Peter must have John 21 in mind, mustn't he? Remember how badly he failed? Remember how beautifully he was restored? You're not one of these men's disciples, are you? I am not. You're not one of the disciples, are you? I am not. Did I not see you with him in the garden? I do not know the man. The cock crowed. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, do you love me? You know that I love you. Tend my lambs. Do you love me? You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. And when the arch shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. Glory, of course, is something we're all hoping for in just a very few hours. This glory, however, is the unfading crown of glory. All flesh is like grass, remember Peter writes in chapter 1, and it's glory like the flowers of the field. Flowers fade. I'm not quite sure whether I can put this politely, but Wimbledon women's final yesterday, the camera kept panning across to previous winners who in their glory were there center stage. And here they were. The newspapers yesterday, running through the English team list from 1966, uh, Alzheimer's died. Dementia died. Heart attack died. Is it just two of them who are still alive? All flesh is like grass. Belle McNally. Did, did you watch that film that came through on your, BB, on your news feed? It is, you've got to watch it. It'll move you to tears. I sort of bit my handkerchief or whatever you do to make sure it was, didn't move me to tears. But it's this little 10-year-old girl, Belle McNally, who Mason Mount walked over after the semi-final on Wednesday or whenever the semi-final was, and he gave her his shirt at the end of a, you know, 90 minutes plus 30 minutes extra time, you'd think, you'd think she was going, oh, take it away. The look on her face, you could count every single one of her teeth. It's just magnificent, the open-mouthed delight. It just it was an extraordinary scene. What's she going to do with the shirt? I'm never going to wash it. I'm going to frame it. I'm not going to sell it. I tell you, I would sell it. I'd wait a few years and I'd sell it, but I'm never going to do those things. And here is Belle McNally. But the smell will go. The shirt will fade. Mason Mount will be dead. You step up to lead in this costly, selfless ministry. Wherever you find yourself, wherever you find the flock of God that is among you, and you will have a share in the unfading crown of glory. The final observation on this little passage we'll pick up, I think, at the end of August for one last session in 1 Peter. But the final piece in this observation is, why is it here? I, I think you would expect to find this in the center of the letter where Peter goes through all the different groups in the church. And I suppose if you had a very rigid understanding of who the older ones are, 
just a rigid group, then you'd whack it in the middle of the, of the section. That's what happens in many other letters. But it's here. What's it doing here? Well, surely because Peter's great concern for the people of God is that they may declare the riches of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He's just been talking about the suffering and the glory. And if the gospel is to advance in whatever demographic, sociological group it may advance in across the globe, if it is to advance in that way, then people, as they become Christians with responsibility, uh, older, younger, but people with recognized responsibility as they become Christian uh, and as they discover other Christians, well, they need to step up to lead. And so as you look at me and say, I urge you, William, step up in whatever the cost may be. I'm looking at you. And I'm saying, wherever you find yourself, you've got the word of God. Whatever responsibilities you have, I urge you, shepherd the flock of God. Two or three children, a family, a couple of households, much as the early church, a couple of households. Yeah, yeah, that's what they were. You know, Gaius, is, the church met in his house. Nympha, the church met in her house. Prisca and Aquila, the church met in that. Three or four households, perhaps, with responsibility. Step up and lead. The Industrial Revolution has happened. You find yourself in an office. Well, you don't, actually, but it may kind of rehappen and you'll come back. There are a few uh, uh, Christians there. Step up and lead. I urge you, if the gospel is going to advance, it'll be costly. And if you find yourself as a sort of 30-year-old younger, just keep breathing and you will find, extraordinarily, you'll be both a younger who teaches the Bible and then an elder who is also an elder who teaches the Bible. Let's pray together. We praise you, our Father in heaven, for the chief shepherd. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, for this extraordinary humility. We thank you that you, the God and creator, of the universe, faithful creator, that you prize humility. Thank you that you oppose the proud. What a wonderful reality that is. We thank you that when you sent your son, he came as the chief shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. And we pray that this genuine, selfless, humble service would mark us out. And where we have failed, Lord, we praise you for your love, the restoration of Peter, and the privilege of being in, a, involved in this great work. In Jesus' name, amen.